He who wants to be first of all will be last of all and servant of all. Gentlemen, you are in the right place. This is Last in Line Leadership Podcast. I am your host, John Shibley, and I just read you from Mark 935. That scripture is all about servant leadership, and that's what we're about here. The podcast that showcases and highlights great leaders of faith, people who have walked the journey of leadership, who have served, who have sacrificed, who have developed discipline, courage, and resilience. You've come to the right place. This is Last in Line Leadership. Hey, we're excited to bring back our guest today. Ryan Mickler needs no introduction, but for those of you that are new, uh, if you haven't seen his work, you got to go follow Ryan Mickler. You got to follow Order of Man. Ryan's been a podcast host and leader of this movement and really the masculinity space for eight or nine years. Uh, forgive the specifics on all his details, but I know he's got in the over a thousand episodes, of course, he's been doing this eight or nine years. He is over 300,000 subscribers on YouTube. He has got millions of downloads to his podcast. The guy doesn't just talk about it. He is about it, and he's the first to tell you about his shortcomings, flaws, failures, mistakes, but he's also determined and resilient enough to develop a plan of making himself better and growing as a dad. And Ryan had an interesting year in 2023. As most of you know, he uh, and his wife were divorced. He moved back to Utah from Maine. And there's been a lot of uphill battles in 2023 for him. But what I like most about Ryan is not only is he a genuine article and a regular guy who does extraordinary things on behalf of you and I and men all over the world, but he's also very transparent and authentic about what he's done, what he needs to do, how he does his business, how he interacts in relationships, how he grows as a man, and really never skipped a beat in helping you and I be encouraged and understand how to be better, bringing on great guests to empower us and really lock arms with Ryan alongside him and all other men. So he and I talk about his challenging year. Of course, we talk about different things uh, regarding his movement, regarding masculinity, regarding things going on in the world a little bit and, and where we've come th to this point as men who lead their families. So guys, I love his podcast. I know you do too. I love what he's about. Most of all, I like that he's interactive. He engages, he communicates, and he doesn't put himself on a pedestal. And I can really respect that, especially with a guy who's been as successful as him. So help me welcome Mr. Ryan Mickler back to Last in Line Podcast. Ryan Mickler, man, it's an honor to have you back. Thanks for coming back to Last in Line Podcast. Of course, man. I've been looking forward to it. Glad we can make it work. So the the blessing and the curse to having you or someone like you on the podcast is uh, so many things to talk about and so little time to do it in and trying not to hit every single thing. But man, you, you just provide so much good stuff that I feel like I want to uh, cover a lot of different things. But before I cover stuff that's on the deeper side, maybe... I got to know what life lessons have you learned from coaching basketball of your son's team? <laughs> well, it's, it's coaching basketball is different th than if you say, which is more accurate, coaching seven-year-olds playing basketball. So if, if I was coaching a <laughs> high school team, the lessons I would learn would be different than if I'm coaching seven-year-olds. Look, for me, it's just letting go of expectation and I told the guys at the beginning of the year, I, I send out a message to all the parents and I'm like, Hey, you know, I'm your son's coach. Here's when practice is. Here's the link for the schedule. Uh, I also say, don't complain. If you do, you're volunteering to help me coach. 
Uh, if you have some, some healthy criticism or some feedback, sure. But if you're going to complain or moan about it, then you're going to coach with me. Uh, and here's what I want. I expect your kids to show up on time. I expect them to be there when practices are there. I expect them to let me know if they're not going to be there, not you, them. And I expect to win. And that's a little different, but I've had a bunch of parents for seven-year-olds anyways, but I've had a bunch of parents who are like, oh my gosh, thank you. What, what, like, what a refreshing way to approach this. Cause nobody's talking like that. It's like, let's have fun. And you know, if they can't make it, whatever. No, I, I do have some expectations, but we go to practice, we work hard, but ultimately when we get to games, like I have to let go and just know that sometimes it's going to go well. And sometimes it isn't, and I'm a control freak. So yeah, learning to let go is a challenge for me, um, but I'm just more pleasant to be around. We do have a lot more fun and we happen to win more games too when we do it that way. Cause there's not all this yeah. weird added pressure and making kids feel like crap because they missed a throw or a free throw or a pass or whatever. Yeah. I mean, I, for a long time I've, I coached baseball and so I know, I know the, the patience isn't, is a given that you learn, but uh, I agree with you, man. Sometimes we just need to treat not only kids, but parents like people and just be straight and this is our expectation. You set that on the front end, man. There's usually very little on the back end that you have to clean up. So, I mean, that's people respect that because, like you said, it it is becoming more rare, unfortunately, uh, in life and kids sports specifically. But um, there's another uh, there's another lesson I learned, and that is, and I've known this, but this just reinforced what I knew is that everybody's different. You know, we we had a couple of team kids on the team, one in particular who was a stud. I mean, he was probably the best player either one or two best player in the league. And he was incredible. Uh, and then we had other players who, you know, have never played basketball before and they weren't incredible because they've never played before. And, and my job as their coach was to coach them from where they are to where they could be and how they could grow and develop. And one thing I see a lot is, especially in this influencer space is guys who are like, this is just the way I am. If they don't like it tough, like if they don't mm -hmm. understand that's their problem. No, as a leader, mm -mm. that's your problem. If your people don't understand or don't think that you love them or care about them or want to see them win, that's not their problem. That's your problem because you're trying to get them to a place they could not go on their own. So I really had to cater, not my personality, but my approach based on what child I was talking with so mm -hmm. I could get the best, their individual best at every game, every practice. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and the guy that says what you just said, it, you know, I wanted to kind of ask what, how's that working for you? How's that leading going? Like who, how many are following that mentality? Not very many, but yeah, it's a you problem. If, if that's your mentality, uh, well, you've had an interesting year. Um, and we certainly don't have to get into the weeds cause I know you've been pretty open and, and communicating all that's gone on in your life. Um, but specifically to the podcast, man, not that you don't every year, but I noticed, man, you had some some knockout guests this year, like you do every year, of course. But, man, I was just looking at the lineup for 23, and, and dude, you had some just names that I know, like most people know, the Pressfields, the Willie Robertsons, Michael Easter, John Lovell, those guys. I mean, uh, Ben Newman I was surprised by. I never knew who he was. I mean, of course, George oh, yeah. Foreman, everybody knows who that is. But Dr. Henry Cloud, I don't know if you remember that episode, but that was interesting for me. Like that, I know him from sort of the the Christian space. He's been an author for years, parenting. I led a, a parenting class based on one of his books. And how did that go? I mean, were were you what'd you think of that? And I know you probably can't remember every single conversation there on that podcast, but tell me some takeaways from that one. I don't know, man. I don't like, yeah. I couldn't tell you the exact thing that we talked about. Yeah. Sometimes it's hard. I have a lot of guys reach out and they're like, how do you, you know, how do you consume information? They're talking specifically about like books. How do you read books and consume all this information? Yeah. Sometimes it's really, really difficult for me because I'm doing an interview per week. And, yep. and what I want to do is put out information that men can hear that they will resonate with and mm -hmm. they might resonate with Henry cloud, or they might resonate with George Foreman or Matthew McConaughey or Tim Tebow or the guy that nobody's ever heard of before. Mm -hmm. um, and then they can take what they want to learn in the way that they want to learn it. That's my job as a host. 
sometimes it's hard because I do have so much information, but I've got notes pulled up here, you yeah. know, note after note after note of, you know, like Adam, Adam Lane Smith, um, that was a good one. another good friend of mine. Uh, who yeah. else do we have on here? Mike Massimino. He's a former NASA astronaut. Like I've had so many guys on and I hope that because I have so many guys on, so it's good. hard to consume that, that it just becomes like part of my DNA and how I communicate effectively. I think with Dr. Cloud, we talked, I want to say we talked about having difficult conversations. Mm. Um, if I remember right. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah he's, he's, he's definitely uh, in the space of communication, parenting relationships. Like he's, he's just, been there for a while. And so, no, we don't have to go into the details of that. I just wondered, that was just an interesting name because I, over following you over the last few years, that that was kind of a different, I don't know if you call it genre when it comes to more of a faith space, because I think that that would, is what he would consider himself for sure. But I know you are uh, growing in that area too. Over the last couple of years, you've been very vocal about your faith and uh yeah, I, I was interested. I mean, last time we talked, you were you were we talked a lot about that, and I think that was cool. But you mentioned Adam Lane Smith, dude. I had that written down. That was awesome. I never knew who he was. I mean, I yeah, he's sharp. That's a good thing too with all this, you know, with these podcasts. Is you come across people that you're like, who? And then you dig into it, and you're thinking, dang. And so I want to get into something he said a little later. Before we do that, though, um, how's the feedback? I know it's been good, but can you talk to a little bit about some of the feedback a year later, I guess, from the book release, uh, masculinity manifesto. I mean, what are you hearing? What are you seeing? Like, I know it's been good, but any specific. Yeah. Comment? I mean, the, the book did really well. Um, it didn't do nearly as well as sovereignty, which is my first book. And, and I think a large part of that had to do with my own personal issues with alcohol abuse and, um, ultimately, you know, my divorce, which have been challenging things over the past 18 months now. Uh, so I, I don't know that I had as much backing, personal backing behind that when that book came out, which I think contributed to the reason it didn't do as well as, as sovereignty, or maybe it's just the messaging. Um, but yeah, I mean, both continue to do pretty well. Uh, I, I think there is a big push for men to live sovereign lives, meaning they have control over their own, mm -hmm. uh, their own, you know, they have responsibility, I should say for the way they live their lives and they want to give it to other people. They want to maintain that control so that they can, you know, create the life that they want. I, I do talk about that though. Sometimes I wonder, I'm like, oh man, did I, did I tempt God with this one? You know, sovereignty, uh, mm -hmm. because ultimately I believe in his sovereignty. And I, and I've thought a lot about that. Does that align with our own? And I, and I believe it does. Because God has given us agency yep. to make our own decisions, sovereignty over our own lives. There's consequences for the decisions that we make, but ultimately we're the ones who get to make them. So I hope that yeah. we can, specifically me, make the right choices in life more often than not. Um, and uh, hopefully my sovereign decisions align with his. Yeah, I think it might, I mean, it might not be honoring to God if we don't take ownership of the sovereignty that he's put us in stewardship of. Like, I agree a hundred percent. Like we sit back and don't take agency, your word on that. Of course, he's going to be like, Hey dude, like I gave you all these gifts. Like I gave you this ability and this sphere of influence. Like, what are we doing? Just kind of like the guy with the talents, you know, the one that thought he was burying the one and thought he was doing a great job. He was actually doing counter what was intended for the whole, the whole drill. Um, so yeah, no, I think I, yeah, I mean, you know, sovereignty, I'm surprised that it did better than the Masculine Manifesto. But again, there were some ancillary items you just mentioned that could have contributed to that. But I thought the manifesto was amazing and um, still think it maybe you haven't even seen it peak yet. Um, maybe it was just kind of a, a delay. It could you be know, a like slow start starter. To, yeah, maybe. As yeah, you the Masculinity Manifesto. Well, it was it was more about leading outward. So yeah. sovereignty was about leading inward, mm -hmm. leading yourself. Masculinity manifesto is about taking your masculine God-given characteristics and then harnessing them, yeah. refining them, leveraging yeah. them for the betterment of yourself and other people, which is what I would call manliness. So there's a distinction between masculinity and manliness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Masculinity is amoral. It's neither good nor bad. And usually you have two camps. People say, oh, masculinity, it's, it's virtuous. 
not really. Or they'll say it's toxic. You have other people who say it's toxic. Not really. Masculinity could be used for either. It could be Mm -hmm. used as a destructive tool to hurt other people, or it could be used as a powerful force for good in the world. Mm -hmm. It's just a matter of how we use it. So if somebody who's masculine learns how to harness his masculine characteristics and then does something with it to serve other people, most people would say, that's a man, right? They'll say that verbatim. That's a man. That guy's manly. That's the distinction. Can he use those characteristics for productive and helpful outcomes for other people? So good. No, it's good. I mean, I think I've heard you say that before and and I it still doesn't get old hearing it. Um, and I would say not that I can quantify, but I know you're keeping different matrix and you have the iron council and watching it grow and those kinds of ways of tangibly gauging the success or impact. But how would you say as a whole in society, we're moving the needle in the right direction when it comes to restoring masculinity, the very thing that your podcast sort of stood on in the beginning and still does? Well, I've seen a lot more movements along these same lines pop up. That's for sure. And I Mm -hmm. love to see that, you know, some, some better than others, some messaging on point and some not, but the fact that we're actually having this conversation in a way that we weren't having it nine years ago when I started this is something. Um, You see guys like Jordan Peterson, who has a lot of great information. Uh, You see guys like Andrew Tate, who has some good information uh, and some, you know, not so good information. Uh, But you see guys like this popping up and, and the amount of people that are having this conversation and then acknowledging and recognizing that there is a problem. That, that not only is it just organically creating a problem based on how men are being raised, but then there's also, I think, an agenda to undermine masculinity because it's, it's at odds with those who want to remain in power. That's where the sovereignty element comes into play. You know, if there's a bunch of strong, capable, bold, assertive, wealthy, independent men with a set of moral values and principles running around they're not going to stand for, uh, you know, government power, consolidation of power at the expense of our citizenry. So, mm. yeah, I think there's an agenda as well built into this. Wow. And then there's yeah. just ignorant, <laughs> ignorant people perpetuating the the agenda. And I don't think they're evil. I just think they're dumb. Yeah. And, and there's just always going to be that camp that's contrarian to whatever seems to be a, a movement that's taking, having trajectory or traction in a right direction. There's always going to be those people that, want to sort of try to clip their heels or cut out the, cut out the Achilles, right. Uh, of that movement. Um, you said something, uh, I, and I don't know if it was yours or not, but and you probably, if it wasn't, you obviously gave credit to whoever it was, but I can't remember, but you said, um, something that was key was, um, what in a situation maybe that you're going to, you have a choice to make, or maybe it's a decision long-term. It doesn't have to necessarily be real granular in the right now, but you said a question you ask yourself is what does the man or what would the man that I'm striving to be do or say in this situation? Have you had any situations that have, I don't know, maybe things that you've decided, make choices you've made recently that you've had to sort of stop yourself or does it just kind of sort of come naturally now to you to just be like, the guy I want to be is going this way. Well, I try not to react to situations. Reactivity is spontaneous. It's instant. It usually lacks any thought or insight or intentionality. I try to respond to situations, which means that I'm intentional. I'm deliberate. I draw upon past experiences. I look into the future and try to identify what decision I make how it will impact me and other people in the future. So I do try to be responsive as opposed to reactive. But yeah, I, I deal with this every day. I mean, I can, I can give you an example after example. Uh, you know, I, I've gone through a divorce. <laughs> so mm-hmm. any man who's gone through a divorce knows that at times it can be contentious with his ex. Those are moments in time where I can either get emotional and reactive and lash out and try to get at her. And believe me, I've wanted to. Mm-hmm. Or... There are moments in time where I can be level-headed and think clearly and get past, you know, the anger or the resentment or frustration and think about how the way I respond will impact her or my children, or maybe my even opportunity to be with my children and undermine what I'm trying to do. So I'm not going to get into specifics because I made a decision 
a year and a half ago that I'm not going to get into those specifics, but mm. yeah, that's, that's almost daily where I have to consider the way that I respond to a situation that to put it mildly can be very contentious. Yep. And responses take a pause, I think, versus a reaction takes no, right? There's no delay. It's pretty much transactional. And then I think responses, I mean, responses can be in a moment, but usually a person that responds in a, in a good way, and I've learned from the wrong way of doing it, takes a pause or, a, you know, a moment or maybe 20 minutes. Like, I don't know. I remember, I think one time you were talking about having communication in relationships and this was years, a couple of years ago, but you were talking about not healthy communication where look, a man will actually walk away and maybe remove himself right from a situation, from an environment, especially the self-aware guy that has been known to either put a hand through the sheetrock or, you know, break something, the guy that knows enough about himself to remove himself. So yeah, I think patience and pause are, are one of those things where responses are require a high level of that. And I've, I've done it wrong for many years, trust me. So um, I do with everybody that's called life sentence. And I want you to finish the sentence for me. Um, it's just okay. a, your perspective. It's usually, like I was saying, it was usually to kind of get behind the curtain with some folks that people may or may not be familiar with. That's not the case with you. Most of my audience knows who you are. Um, but I want to get your take on a few of these things. So, okay. um, yeah, here we go. This is you talking. You finish the sentence. I define masculine servant leadership as making myself capable of leading others effectively. I think most people say Ser serve other people. I think you should serve other people, but you have to do it from a place of capability. If I'm incapable of serving others, what, what good am I? Sure. All right. Here we go. These are light. All right. In one of the more trying years of my life, the silver lining to my self-development has been? Awareness of my own shortcomings. Truth. So that I can actually do something about it. I mean, if, if I can comment on that, like it seems like for since I've been following you, you've always seemed pretty self-aware of both, like the good and the areas that you need improvement. Maybe maybe you haven't fully been transparent with yourself. I don't know, but it comes across comes across that way. Well, so. uh, you know, it's it's like the scripture by the fruits, ye shall know thee. So, I mean, I appreciate the, the vote of confidence and the mm -hmm. compliment there, but the reality for a little bit painted a different picture. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I like what you're saying, but I didn't always produce the results that I desire, favorable results for me and other people I care about. So clearly either I wasn't honest mm. or I didn't do the right things about it. That that's I think that applies to everybody. So we can know things, right? But execution is different and action on the back end. We can know something, but getting it adjusted, that's a different story. And I, I think it can be both. Um all right, here's another one. Well, let me, can I say yeah, one other, other thing Absolutely. on that? Absolutely. So yeah. as I was going through this and was very public about my own issues and what my shortcomings, a lot of people said, oh, it's hypocritical. And you know, I, I, I've wrestled with that. Is it, you know, because here's the ultimate, here's the ultimate thing. I always believed in what I shared. And I know that if we implement in our lives, the things that I share, that I will produce favorable results. Like I know that to be true. Mm -hmm. And yet I find it difficult as does everybody to always do that, to always do what we know to be true. So yeah, to your point, you can absolutely know what to do and still find it a challenge to complete. So our job is to bridge, I call it the integrity gap. And I have that integrity gap as do we all vary to varying degrees, but the integrity gap closes or narrows when we align what we know we should be doing and what we're actually doing. When those two are harmonious, it bridges that gap. Yeah. And if I remember right, the reason you started Order of Man was because you assessed some areas that you needed to shore up and you knew that you couldn't do that on your own and needed to find those people that kind of knew what was going on. You kind of compiled information, right? So you were very obviously aware that you needed work. And I, I don't think that ever changed throughout. But um, I, I, yeah, if you were if you were viewed as hypocritical, I don't think people would, A, you wouldn't have come on here. B, you wouldn't have sold a bunch of books. C, you wouldn't still have the following you have because I can I can imagine it's still sizable like it always was. So, course, yeah, you yeah. got a lot of people standing with you. Um, so, you know, 
I guess let me do this last one because it's it's a it's a deeper one. All right, so okay. you, you'll like this. I mean, you you're a jujitsu guy. I can't phase you. So, um, <laughs> how about, about that? <laughs> Here we go. One of my favorite things about following Jesus is not having to guess what is right. You don't have to guess. Like it's there. <laughs> it's it's all documented. It's all written. It's all etched into our souls. I don't have to guess about the right thing to do. I was watching, uh, I've been watching Ted Lasso lately mm. and, and, uh, what did he say? I, gosh, I, I wish I could remember exactly what he, what he said, but he said, you know, doing the right thing is always the right thing to do. Now it's not always easy. It's not always comfortable. It's not always going to work out in your favor, but doing the right thing is always the right thing to do. And I don't have to guess like, Oh, well, what if, Nope, doesn't matter. There is no, what if we are just, we are instructed to do the right thing. And I think inherently we know what the right thing is. We justify right. it. We rationalize it away. We, we conflate it and confuse it. But for the most part, we know what to do. You're right. And I think we do have a group of Christians out there too that, uh, and I've probably been guilty of this at some point, but they, they like to manipulate the scripture and kind of move things around to fit their narrative sometimes. And when you say truth and when you say what's right, to me, it's black and white because it's in print. But a lot of Christians have, taking kind of what makes sense in that moment. I call situational ethics or whatever you want to call it, but they, they kind of move words around in their own life to apply the scripture to that situation instead of just taking it at face value, like you're saying, and be like, no, no, that's not gray. <laughs> it's, it's black and white. In fact, it's, you know, it's in red. So he's, you know, he's saying this. So uh, I like that answer. Do you have anything to add to that? No. I think, okay. I think that's, ex it's hard though, because everything is subject to interpretation and we look at it. Like I, I will say it's black and white and then somebody else will say something completely opposite and then also say it's black and white. So who's right. Uh, you got to decide that for yourself. And if we're talking about it from a spiritual perspective, that's between you and God to figure out. Okay. Yeah. Cause I would argue then at that point, what, what gauge are we using to determine like, what's the litmus test of, right and wrong. And, and so, uh, you, well, I, I think with like yeah. society, you can say what's going to best serve society, but even then, you know, like, so for example, we could take open border policy mm. and I could say, Hey, what's going to serve our society, the United States of America is to shut down the borders and be more selective about who we bring in and why we're bringing them in. And then other people could say, well, no, we should leave them open because if we're talking about from a societal perspective, those people deserve every opportunity that we have too. So like it's, you could, it, it, regardless of where you're coming from, you know, you can paint a picture. So it's, it's hard at times. Yeah, it is. And we could probably go off on a couple of diatribes there. And uh, yeah, I, I will commend you on the fact, and, and this is by choice, I'm sure, but the fact that you managed to keep to a degree, to a big degree, politics out of most of your conversations on your podcast, mostly. Now, I'm sure some of the tangential topics are related in some way, but I think you stay pretty, pretty clean of that. Is that intentional? Yeah, I, I mean, everything can be political now, mm -hmm. so I don't. I don't get into left and right and conservative and liberal, but I mean, clearly I have a conservative yeah. tint towards the, the podcast and the movement. And I, I believe that conservative values tend to align more closely with manliness and masculinity. Yeah. So yeah, I may not get into the, the semantics and the, and the words and the political gamesmanship, but yeah. I, I think that there are some values that I have that happen to align with a more conservative approach to, to the world. For sure. And I don't know that it's always been that way. And I'm certainly not a political guy. Like I, I don't talk about it either. Uh, but I did hear this quote. Um, somebody was telling me that Ronald Reagan had said that he didn't leave the democratic party. The democratic party left him. And what he means by that is obviously that that party has changed that you didn't always used to look like it does now. So for whatever that's worth, I think you're right though. You've definitely leaned that way. Um, conservative, uh, for sure. But all right. So Adam Lane Smith, dude, I, I, <laughs> I don't know why I just, something resonated with me on that episode and, and, uh, you've had a lot of great guests, but I got to read a quote to you. And then I have a question for you about it. Okay. Um, and maybe it's just because of re 
recency bias. I don't know. I listened to it, whatever, it was a few weeks ago. So yeah, in the moment, yeah, in the moment of servitude, okay, this is him talking. In the moment of servitude, you must maintain personal sovereignty. You are choosing to serve not because you must, but because it aligns with your purpose, mission, desire, and assignment. You are choosing to serve others because it serves a greater good, which you are of service to. That's a wordy quote. I get it. But I don't, man, in the moment, I literally pulled my car over, played it back, right? Typed it out just because it felt like there was weight to it. Um, so like I said, you started ordering a man because you had a personal need in your life. You were trying to level up in a way or multiple ways. Um, uh, when was it, or what was it that, that finally the, the crystallizing moment where you were like, okay, this aligns, my mission aligns with serving men and the masculinity movement. Like, how did you know that that was your thing just because you started from needing it yourself? Yeah. I don't know if there was a specific moment where that happened. I sure. think that just evolved organically, but yeah, you, oh, here's an interesting story. I was in the gym this morning and there was a guy in front of me working out on one of the the machines in front of me. And the guy was strong. He, he had tattoos and he was jacked and he was big. And I had seen him wearing some order of man stuff before. And I asked him, I said, Hey, are you using this, this rope? And he's like, no, man, go ahead. So I grabbed it and he came over and he's like, Hey, I wanted to talk with you. We had never talked. Uh, so we started talking and he's like, yeah, I've been following your work. And, and he said something funny. He said, yeah, I, I found you. And then I found Jack Donovan through you. And I kind of chuckled and he's like, what's that? And I said, you actually look like Jack Donovan. Like I saw your shirt. It's, it, is that a Jack Donovan, like a start the world shirt? He's like, yeah. I'm like, yeah. And you're built like him. You look like him. And he's like, yeah, I've been following. I went to his stuff. The mm. reason I bring this up is because we find our tribes. Mm. So I'm not for everybody. And, and I know that there's a bunch of people who don't resonate with me because they don't like me or just because they don't resonate. And either one is fine. I don't need to be there for everybody. But when I started Order of Man, it was to serve me because I needed to get help. But what I realized is there's a bunch of guys like me who see the world in a very similar way, who want to learn, who want to grow, who learn information in similar ways. And all I had to do was serve those people. So you'll notice on the podcast, I don't ever say, hello, ladies and gentlemen. I don't ever address women. It's not that they're not important. It's not that I don't think that they need to develop too. It's that I don't, that's not the audience we serve. Now, historically, roughly, give or take, about 20% of our demographic, whether it's on social media or the podcast, happens to be women. Now, I'm not going to change my message just because 20% of the people who listen happen to be women. If they feel like they can get value in the way that I share the information, then I'd love to have them here in our tribe and in our organization. But I speak to people who want to hear a message in a way that I and my guests have to share it. And I don't feel like I need to serve everybody. And those people, I stand, I try to anyways, as, as uh, I don't want to say beacon, it sounds so pretentious, but I mm -hmm. stand on this hill and I share it this way. And those who are interested can find it. And those who aren't can go find whatever hill they want to stand on. Yeah. And to your point earlier, there's, there started to this whole, I guess the variations of the same movement have started to creep up in different pockets. And, and that's a good thing, I guess, for those people that may bounce thing. off of you into another tribe, you know, that they might, might stick to a little more. Well, this, this gentleman I talked to today, he told me about, he used to fight in MMA. He had a, uh, an, a brutal injury that almost killed him. I guess he lacerated his pancreas and Whoa. The, the pancreatic fluid was uh, being released into mm -hmm. his body. I don't know all the details, but he was talking about this and he almost died. And, um, you know, he recovered and got back on track and, you know, he's, he's following a lot of what Jack Donovan has to share and his life is better for it. So who am I to say he should not be doing that? He should be following exactly what we prescribe. I don't know. Whatever he's doing seems to be working. So all the power to you. If that's your tribe, I support that. If it helps you be a better person, I'm, I'm in support of it. Yeah. And, and by the way, I'm a huge fan of Jack, Jack Donovan too. So I don't want to make it sound like I'm not. He's yeah. a friend. We're friends. I believe in his mission and what he's doing. He believes in mine. Even though we don't always see eye to eye, we still respect what each other are doing in our own way. I mean, that's refreshing because, I mean, in a world we live in now, boy, if you 
at all disagree with anything. It's automatically us versus them. It's me versus you, man. It We can't ever disagree. So that's good to hear because we're all literally the eye is on the same prize. We're just going a, a different route to get there. And so, um, well, man, there are you, some things that yeah. I, that I would disagree with that on. There are some things that are a direct threat to our well being, And I think when those situations arise, I'm not really willing to compromise and I'm not really willing to find common ground. That's an enemy. That thought is an enemy to what I think is the right way to do it. And I'm not going to back down to that. And then there's other things sure. where it's, Hey, we're in the same fight. We're just seeing it differently, but there are battles that I'm going to fight. You better 100%. believe hundred percent. Please. Thank you for clarifying. Yeah. No, I mean the guys that are on the same side of the yeah. fight have a different way of attracting those to get in their army. And man, you said something for a long time and, and it resonated with me and still does. And I'm, I'm a little regretful that I kind of got it later in life, but you know, maybe I got more than I think, but I didn't word it this way, but you talk a lot about network and framework. Like, to me, that that seems pretty foundational for you. If we had to pick two things that life operates on, aside from faith, like framework and network. Framework. Um, I actually, you don't always have both. You can have one. You can have the other. Some have both, but just because you have one doesn't mean you have the other. What? Talk to me about framework. Give me a kind of a specific context as to what that means for somebody listening that may not get that. A framework is ju it's just a system. That's all it is. So everything in life, I have a system for. Uh, I don't start my day without implementing my battle planning system. This is a framework. Mm. It's, a, it's something I go through every single day. I complete, I fill out every morning, every night, and I do it. And when I deviate from the framework, then my life goes sideways. When I get back to the framework, then my life improves. That's all it is. It's just a system. If we're coaching basketball, for seven, seven, uh, seven year olds, I don't go and just show up and just like randomly throw the ball at them and like see if we can figure it out. No, I go to practice with a schedule, with a routine, with a plan. We work the plan. Sometimes I have to deviate, sometimes I have to change the plan, but I have a plan. It's a framework. We work best under frameworks because what we can do when we have a framework is we can replicate results. The worst thing that mm. can happen to you if you don't have a framework is that you can succeed. Doesn't that sound funny? You succeed. That's the worst thing that can happen. I'll tell you why. Because you begin to believe you have it figured out. But if you have a framework, you don't have it figured out. You just got lucky. Yep. I want a framework that has replica replicatable results that I can just go over and I can turn on and I say, if I do this, here's the results. I use a, a nutritionist and, and fitness coach. His name's Johnny Loretti. Mm -hmm. He has me on a program. If I do that program to the T, here's the results that I will produce. If I'm not producing those results, it's because I'm not doing the program. Mm -hmm. And then I can isolate, well, Ryan, you're lifting, you're doing great there, but you're eating like garbage. Okay. Now I can begin to focus on that aspect of my life in order to achieve the result that I desire. The system is crucial so you can replicate results and you can isolate where it's not working so you can fix it. Yep. And, and the good thing too, to the to the analogy of the basketball team, you could hand that to whoever, if you couldn't make a game to coach, right? You could hand that to your assistant and he could, like you said, replicate the methodology. He could, the drills, whatever, like the framework allows for it to also, I think, multiply and be able to share with other people and they can use it just like you're doing with the battle planner. Like that didn't just start out being in the hands of thousands of people. Like, that became something you and a team maybe came up with that solidified who you were as people, the structure you took, the processes you took, the, the outcomes. And here, here we are now with a book that helps guys have the framework on a daily basis. So you can hand that to somebody and it can be multiplied. Um, and I think that's handy. But network is the one I kind of, well, look before I go to network. Framework too, I believe, and in integrity fits into that, right? And your faith fits into that. Spirituality fits into that. The framework of who you are as a person, right? Maybe not just tactically how you do stuff, but who you are, uh, that's huge because I think that bleeds into whether or not your network is A, scalable or sustainable. Um, 
if people kind of think you're, I don't know, a sketchy dude, you're, you're probably, your network's probably not going to grow, right? Because of whatever reputation you have. Talk about your network, how you were able to sort of build that. I mean, I, I don't know a better way to ask that question, but you didn't start out with a bunch of these high level friends. So you had a framework, you started delivering on those expectations of yourself. And then the, the network, I assume, followed. In my experience, the best way to build a network, which is just people. Sure. The best way to build a network is to serve without any expectation of anything in return. That's it. And you know, you know when somebody's doing something because they're keeping score, or you know that somebody's doing something because they're going to call in that favor at a later date, you know, everybody mm. sees right through it. Mm. And we've all been that guy. Don't be that guy. Do you really care about these people and the people in my life? Some of the people that others might hear about or the people that they have no idea about. I actually care about those people. I would and do serve those people without any expectation of anything in return. So if I want to meet with somebody to have them on the podcast, I got to figure out what their desire is. And I have to figure out a way to help them achieve that goal purely because I want them to achieve that goal. Now, sometimes our desire is a line, a podcast guest, for example, maybe somebody wants to sell their book and I have a platform for them to be able to do it. And so our values align. They want to sell a book. I have a platform that's a good big name, somebody that people would resonate with. It serves both people. That's fine. But ultimately mm -hmm. my pure soul responsibility or, or desire is to serve those people, find out what they need and figure out a way to do it. And one of the best ways to do that is to make introductions. The more introductions that you can make to people, uh, you get to leverage both parties' networks. You get to build goodwill with both parties in one action. Um, it's it's a great way to build a network. I've actually implemented that. And, and I think I had sort of, I mean, I bought into that concept before I ever heard you say it, but when you mention it fairly regular about doing that for somebody with A, nothing in return expected, but connecting to i mean what better way is obvious that it's really not self-serving other than to say hey you need to meet him and you do too and you guys go have a conversation and then i'm out of it like to me right. that is obvious that you're not trying to gain anything from that but um so you've had plenty of success doing that and i'm sure you've been on the receiving end of some of that but um the guy that's trying to build the framework in the network like Maybe he's a little later in life, like I mentioned for me. What what do you have for him? Because we could all look back and go, man, I wish I had this when I was 20, of course. But never too late to start it, right? But what do you say to the guy that maybe is 50 and he doesn't have the network he really wanted? Is it the same framework, I guess, to get that network? Yeah, I mean, the, the guy who's 20, I'd say add value to people's lives. The guy who's yeah. 50, add value to people's lives. The guy who's 50 has an advantage. He knows more people. He has more experience. He has more resources. You know, generally 50 year olds have more wealth than 20 year olds. Generally 50 year olds know more people than 20 year olds. Generally mm -hmm. 50 year olds have been to more places and have more experiences than 20 year olds. Mm -hmm. So a 50 year old just has a better opportunity to leverage his own resources for the betterment of other people's lives. But the, the, the system's no different. It's just add value to people's lives. Use what resources you have and give abundantly and share and then you know, you'll build the network that you want. Yeah, no, it's good. I mean, part of that kind of leads into my question that I had um, going forward here, but not to be redundant if it crosses over, it does, but maybe take a different stab at it. But your attributes and skill sets have been translatable, right? Have been transferable from different industries to different industries. You were in financial planning. You, you know, have done some other things before that, obviously, but then transition into this. What about Ryan Mickler? And, and you've mentioned this too, is because of the network too. If this for some reason burned to the ground tomorrow, you've probably got 10 job offers right now. I don't know, doing pretty well in life. So what about you is so translatable or transferable from industry to industry from a skill set standpoint? Can you share? Yeah, I, th I think first and foremost, I'm willing to take action. I think there's a lot of guys out there who have ideas and thoughts and insights and 
cool things they could be doing and they just don't move on it because they're scared or because they're busy or because whatever. I don't do that. If I have something I want to do, I do it. And there's obstacles that come up. There's things I need to be aware of, but I just plow through those things. One of my favorite quotes is I will find a way or make one. It's a lat. It's in Latin. I don't know how to pronounce it in Latin, but it's, I, I shall either find a way or make one. Hmm. So I don't, I don't get in the game of like, I don't know, I'm busy or I don't know how to do that. Maybe I shouldn't. I don't, that's not a game I play. I don't operate in that way. Uh, and well, then the other thing, go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. The only other thing I would say there, I mean, there's a lot, but I think these two stand out and I'm trying, like, I'm not trying to toot my own horn. I just think these are virtues that I try to espouse is I try to be a man who follows through on the things he says he's going to do. I take initiative. So if I say I'm going to be there at seven, I'm going to be there at seven. If I'm not, for some reason, I'm going to call. Well, here's a great example. Uh, yesterday, we had a podcast scheduled for yesterday. I couldn't make it. I had some scheduling conflicts. So I messaged you as soon as I could. Mm-hmm. And you know that happens. But what did I do? I presented another opportunity. Like I didn't just say, hey, I can't make it. See you later. I was mm-hmm. like, hey, I can't make it, but I could do it the next day or the following. Mm-hmm. And here we are. Like Things come up. But I try to be somebody that people can rely on. That if Ryan says he's going to do something, then I know it's going to be done and I don't have to worry about. And that person is always marketable, is always in season, and people want to be around a guy like that. I mean, yeah, and I agree. That's that's a commodity, and it. I guess it's unfortunate that we gotta that we gotta make that known. And why that and why that's a commodity is because it's becoming increasingly rare. I guess because I believe Which now fortu- it's actually fortunate. It's, it's not fortunate, fortunate for us, sure. Yes, yeah. <laughs> right. Let's look at it that way. Hey, it's, it's just, fortunate. If I just follow through on what I say I'm gonna do, I'm gonna yeah. win. You're that's a commodity, easy. absolutely. I just wish, I guess the world, when I say, unfortunately, I I think the world might be a better place if everybody adopted some sort of reliability agency. You know what I mean? So yeah, yeah. but you're right, man. Uh, My, my dad used to say, dude, be glad that the rest of the world's pretty stupid and find a way to make money at that. Like (laughs) (laughs) that was my dad though. That was different, different animal. Um, so you're, no, he's not wrong. (laughs) He's like, most people are lazy. Most people don't want to take initiative. Most people won't follow through. Most people won't come up with plans. And so just be the guy who does that. And then you'll win. Well, why, why are you? Okay. So in so many words, you said you're pretty much fearless when it comes to. No. If you think something, meaning, meaning when an endeavor hits you and you're like, I want to, you're determined to achieve it. You don't even really think about failing. You just kind of go at it and plow through it. And if you fail, you clean it up and you keep going. Like that's, that too is, is rare for guys. I hear guys that are like, I don't know. I don't, you know, one of those, would you not say that you are fearless when it comes to taking the bull by the, by the horns and just plowing through? No, I I think I still have fear. I think that still creeps in. I don't let it consume me. I drive on in spite of it. You know, if I'm afraid of something, it's like, okay, well, what do I need to do to figure it out? Cause some of those fears might be valid. I don't buy into the True. What are they, what are they fear is false evidence appearing real? No fear. Like that's a real thing that people deal with. And you might be responding to something that isn't as severe as you believe it to be, but it's still fear is a real thing. Sure. So I don't, I don't run away from fear, like acknowledging that I'm afraid. Mm-hmm. Um, and I also don't run away from the idea of failure. Like people will also say fail. That's just first attempt in learning. No, you failed. Like, I don't need to doll this up. You failed. Yeah. Meaning you fell short of what you wanted to accomplish. Like, just own it. When we, when we make cute little acronyms and we pretend mm-hmm. like failure doesn't exist and now oh, we're not, you're not actually confronting the problem. The problem mm-hmm. is, is you were deficient in whatever capability you needed to possess in order to accomplish your objective. Okay. And like, that's not the end of the world. The very first event we did, or at least tried to do, I didn't have a single person sign up. Did I fail? Yeah. I lost money and time. I failed. Did it deter me? No. I made another event and learned to market it better because that's what I had to do. And we sold out. And I've sold out every event, every single event that we've done since. There hasn't been an event I've fallen short on. I failed. It's, it's okay. Like, stop 
dolling it yeah. up. Stop pretending it doesn't exist. Stop running away from it. Stop brushing it under the rug. Fear is real. Failure is real. Get over it and do it in spite of it. Yeah. Cause what did it, I mean, like you said earlier, the hill we're dying on is worth all that. Like, let's just go so. take the shrapnel, right? Take the bullets, take the failure, take the crap on the face, whatever you, you know, the humble pie, you know, you talk a lot about humility. Uh, I mean, go through, go through it and, and just take it. And, and, but if it's worth it, then you'll get through the, uh, to the other side. That's what people I think get debilitated by is, well, it's just going to just absolutely destroy everything and it's going to be death and I'm never going to make it through. Well, we get to the other side of those things. We always blow them up. Like you said, bigger than what they are. Um, and, well, and I have a friend, um, his name is Alan Placer. He's in the iron council. It's an integral part of what we're doing in the iron council. And he has a, a phrase that I really like called finish your failure. And when we pretend failure doesn't exist, we don't give ourselves an opportunity to finish the failure. And the fi you have to put a period at the end of each sentence. Otherwise it just becomes a run on sentence and nobody mm -hmm. understands what in the world you're trying to say. Mm -hmm. We, we have those things in place to help understand when we're starting a new sentence or a new paragraph or a new chapter. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing in your life. You got to put a period on it. I, I went through a divorce. If I didn't say that I failed and I did, I failed. If I didn't say that, then I'd be clinging on to this relationship or, or, or something that never could be again, or not allowing myself an opportunity to move on. I have to put a period on the end of the sentence and say, yep, failure. It was a failure. Now, what did I learn from it and how can I implement that into my next relationship and what can I do to salvage the relationship in this case with my children? But I have to finish the failure before I move on in other avenues of my life. Yeah. And it does, it's finality, but it's not, it's finality to that particular chapter, I guess, not the entire story. So well, I think that's dead. what people need to understand. You know what I mean? Yeah. The yeah. story's not over. That chapter might just be closed and then we open a new one, but um, he also said something interesting in addition to the failures, not final one, one time, this is about a year ago, maybe a little longer. He texted me and he said, Hey Ryan, I want you to know something. Your sort, your story is a success story. It's just not finished yet. So you're not to the success part yet, but it is a success story because you're going to overcome this. That'll stick with me forever. Wow. Wow. Well, I believe it, man. Uh, well, so do you have anything just as a side here, like, and I know you, man, I know you well enough to know I'm probably teeing myself up to get land blasted on this question because you're, you're one of the better question askers in the game. So, and I'm not giving you, I'm not trying to just give you a compliment. It's a, it's, it's a fact. Um, I so I'm going to throw this out there and you, <laughs> you can team me up. All right. I'll give want. it to you if I need to. All right. To. So two things, it's a two part question. What gets you out of bed in the morning and then what keeps you up at night? I don't know, man. I'm, I'm excited about life. I'm excited about opportunities. I'm excited to be better than I was the day before. I also have a purpose, you know, and that's a God given purpose. I'm here for a reason. I know what it is. And so there's days where I'm like, ah, I don't want to get out of bed. And I talk myself out of it. Anyways, there's days I don't want to podcast or send that email. And I do it anyways, because it's an alignment with my purpose. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it's, it's being a father, it's being a friend. Um, it's, it's being a, a business owner. It's being the, the person who's going to move this mission and movement forward. Mm -hmm. It's all of those things. I don't, well, I don't really know if it's one thing. Yeah, no. So then a better way to ask that might be what, what's sort of the burden that you feel for men as a whole in our nation, let's say, or masculinity movement in general. Like it, when I say what keeps you up at night, like what's that thing that just kind of you can't shake from your mind and it's obviously a driver that motivates you and keeps you pushing forward. But what, what is that one particular, or that particular burden for guys that you feel as a whole out there? I just, I want them to be fulfilled and too many men are, they're empty shells of what they could be. They're walking through the motions. They're miserable. You can see it just drive down the road on the way home from work today and just look around and you'll see the guys in the car and they're overweight and they're like slouched in their car and maybe they're driving a minivan and you know, it's their wife's minivan and they're coming back from a job they hate and they're just beat up. And then they go home and they get, you know, henpecked by their wife and their kids are little a-holes. And it's like, these are the guys, like, I feel for those guys. And I don't, I don't want that to be the case. You know, I, I see guys in the gym and I'm like, man, like no judgment. Like I'm not thinking poorly of them. I'm just thinking, I know your potential. Mm. And I see a guy who's a hundred pounds overweight in the gym Again, no, he's in the gym. 
And what I see is a guy who could be a hundred pounds lighter and shed all of that baggage and bullshit literally yeah. so that he can become who he's capable of becoming. He can assert himself at, at his career. He can get a promotion. He can start a new business. He can take on a project. He can lead his wife. He can be assertive. He can communicate effectively. He can feel good and proud about the way that he looks and the way he commands presence mm -hmm. and respect and influence in other people. That's what I want. You know, when I see a guy who's not that, I don't think less of the guy. I want to help. What, what can I do to help? Do you need to get in better shape? Do you need to learn how to communicate? Do you need to, to have a system, a framework for your life? Do you need to set goals? Do you need a system to be able to follow through on your goals? Yeah. What do you need? That's what we're trying to provide. Yeah. And, and you're right, man. You can, you don't have to look very far to see that shell of a human. Um, and we don't know what's happened in their life, obviously, but they weren't designed to end up that way. Right. That may be how, where they are in this moment, but we all know you and I know God didn't design us to be, if we're in his image and he's given us gifts and he's given us all a purpose, then, then no one's designed to stay there. So a lot of the guys that listen to me, I would say, don't fit in that category. So that's good. There are a lot of the same people that listen to you. But um, yeah, I, I feel for those people. And if if they could just have a glimmer right, of confidence or something, like we said earlier, the guy that they could potentially be, if they could get a glimpse of that, I think that's what your movement is doing for for people is, is showing them a picture of what the potential is. Um, and, and so your quote that you, and I'll end with this one. Um, your quote that you posted, I think this week, it was just a couple of days ago, uh, says God is going to present us with all sorts of opportunities cloaked in adversity and our ability to rise to the challenge and come out on top is what makes us a man. So obviously you've had some opportunities cloaked as adversity this year, right? Um, where would you, how would you say, or what? advice that's a terrible word i mean that's just typical podcast word but what would you say to guys that maybe you have been in the same situation with a relationship maybe they had a little hiccup spiritually i don't know maybe you took a step back physically but in those seasons of what you would maybe say is the most severe adversity of your life to this point what has broken you through to that other side like what got you there I think we kind of, yeah, I think we let off with it is what would the man I want to be do mm. in this situation or put another way, if I were to drop you into the same circumstance you are right now, would you handle it the same way that you currently are? Mm. If you got a do over, would you do it the same? If the answer is yes, then you're doing right. I can honestly say, I can look myself in the mirror and I could say, mm. if I was dropped in the same set of circumstances in the future, 20 years from now. I would play my hand the exact same way that I played it this time. That's a powerful place to be. I put a period at the end of the sentence. That chapter is closed. I can still be something more than I currently am. There is that future version of myself. And all I have to do now is work towards becoming that person. And those are just micro decisions that we make every day. Did I get out of bed or did I hit snooze? Did I put the you know, the bag of chips down and eat some celery or something? <laughs> Did I go for my run? Did I show up to work with a hundred percent gain? Did I tell my wife I loved her? Did I talk to my kids? Did I engage with them? If you can pass all of those tests, that man is not very far away. He's really not. He's very close. If wow. we do that day in and day out. Wow. That's great. As well said right there. I, I like that a lot. Um, I'm going to clip that part out and I'm going to use that again. Uh, but there's a scripture I want to, and then I want to ask you one more thing to close because I, I lied. That wasn't the last thing. So in Isaiah 43, 18 and 19, it says, and this is my favorite scripture, really. Uh, in Isaiah, uh, even. Hard to pick one, right? Yeah. No, hard to pick one scripture, but it says, remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and a river in the des desert. What is a new thing for Ryan Mickler this year, you think? What's going to be, what's one of those things you're pursuing that may be new to you? Or what do you, 
Is there anything you're trying? Is there anything you're like looking forward to because it's sort of an unknown for you? Anything out there? And I know you don't, you can't see into the future, but give me an idea yeah. of what you think you're pursuing that's new. I don't, I don't know if there's like one thing where I'm, this is my goal for the year. I mean, I have goals, right? Like I want to bring events back. I'm, I'm learning how to ski. Like there's things. Okay. Right? There you go. Yeah. Yeah. But for me, the word that really stands out to me right now is ex exceptionalism. Hmm. That when I do something, I want to be exceptional. Not that I perceive per or achieve perfection or that I'm the, the, the best person who ever did that thing but that I do it exceptionally well. So when I show up to this podcast, was I present and engaged or was I on my phone and like checking emails and the lighting wasn't right and my camera and microphone are off? No, I want it to be exceptional. When I go to the gym, do I just go through the motions? Which admittedly I do, you know, of course. There's some days I do, but I want to be exceptional. I want to have the right form on my bench press. I want to continue to level up. I want to do the movement correctly. I don't want I want to use my back when I'm supposed to be using my biceps. Is my room clean? Did I make my bed? What, is my, what does my truck look like? Does it look like a, a dumpster, the same dumpster behind McDonald's? That's how a lot of men's trucks look like. Mm. I don't want it to look like that. I want it to be clean and orderly and vacuumed out and washed. So part of what I've really been focused on, because I know I want to be exceptional with the things that I do, I've had to say no to a lot more things I normally would say yes to. Because if I'm going to spend time being exceptional in things, that time has to come from somewhere. I can't do everything exceptionally well. Mm -hmm. So I have to cut some things out of my life so I can focus on the few things that are very, very important to me. Well, thanks for, thanks for not saying no to this. I appreciate it. It's been, it's course, been awesome to you, man, to have you, yeah. uh, always a pleasure. Always good, man. I, Likewise. I know we've never met in person and, and I've probably done very we little will. to serve you, but, uh, I, I consider you a friend from from afar, honestly. So I I appreciate all that you do for the masses, and I I can't wait to see what it looks like for you in 2024. So audience, he has been Ryan Mickler. We've been last in line. Be blessed.